um, I feel as though I'm walking in the footsteps of giants. In the last two occasions I've been sitting with you, I've listened to C.Q. Strawn uh, and Gary Sheffield, two eminent historians, so uh, it, it, it's something of an honour, if not an ordeal, uh, to find myself following on after them. Uh, some of you will have been here last year and heard me talk on the road to Waterloo, uh, for those who are here, I will not be asking you any questions of homework, um, but I will, forgive me, give a quick revise of that before we move forward into Waterloo itself, because it really does need just a few minutes to set the scene. I'm going to start the road to Waterloo, although for many people, and if I might say soldiers, in regiments like the Black Watch, the road to Waterloo may have started 20 years before, uh, having fought in Holland, having fought in Egypt, having fought all the way through the Peninsula War into France, and then finally to here. So for many it was a long road, for some a very short road. As you will know, uh, at Toulouse, the Black Watch lost almost 200 soldiers in 1814. So in 1815, you got a lot of very new young soldiers as well as some experienced veterans. So the road varied. But the road tonight really starts with the abdication of Napoleon, completely surrounded, having fought in one of his best campaigns, but forced to abdicate uh, by all the Allies in yet another coalition that had come together to bring him down in 1814. And he's sent off to Elba, and he takes with him about a thousand men. And he's there for about eight months before he decides to return. And the reason for his return is very simple. The Bourbons, Louis XVIII, who has come back to the throne, has learned nothing and forgotten nothing. It's the same bad old Bourbons. And very quickly, France grows out of favour with the returned monarchy. And so on the 26th of February, Napoleon sets sail, and he lands in the south of France and begins his march north with these thousand men. He knows every regiment by name and every battle honour and many of the officers. The 5th Regiment of Line moves to stop him and they come across, he invites them to fire on him and instead they join him. On the 8th at Grenoble, the 7th of the line do exactly the same. Before Grenoble I was only a venturer. After Grenoble I was a prince. On the 18th of March, Marshal Ney, who will come across in, in detail at the Battle of Waterloo, again is sent down by the Bourbon King with 6,000 men, and he too comes across. At about that time, a wagon Paris published, reputing to come from Napoleon, a message saying, please send me no more soldiers, I've got enough. <laughs> Louis abandons Paris on the 19th and Napoleon marches in, takes over, and so we have what is really about the 100 days, the interim between the 20th of March and beginning of June and the campaign I'm going to talk about tonight. I think you need to remember that Napoleon is not just there to put together an army. He is the emperor, so he is spending all that time organising the, the finances of the country, the government of the country, the military recruiting of the country, a huge portfolio, not just a commander-in-chief, but the emperor. So, we move rapidly towards the beginning of the conflict. And at the beginning of May, it is quite clear that Napoleon is mustering his armies. He has no choice, because he has been declared an enemy, effectively, of Europe and the world. Personally, not just France, Napoleon. So there is going to be no escape. There's going to be another abdication or anything else. <laughs> this diagram is designed to illustrate to you that the Waterloo, the Waterloo campaign, is just part of a problem. It happens to be where the decisive action is fought. But what Napoleon faces is 106,000 Allies at the top, 128,000 Prussians, 25,000 more Prussians, Hopefully you can read the figures for yourself. There's 200 Russians coming in his direction. There's 210,000 Austrians coming in his direction. There's more coming out of Italy and an 80,000 strong army preparing itself in Spain and Portugal. It is not an isolated campaign. This is an orchestrated attempt to overthrow Napoleon. 
So the corollary is that he cannot put all his forces in one basket and fight Wellington and Blucher. So the figures in blue show where the French army is. 128,000 is actually what he's going to fight Napoleon uh, with, is what he's going to fight Wellington and Blucher with. But he has 20,000, 23,000, 8,400, all guarding the various entries into France and prepared to push back and hold the Austrians, hold back the Italians, hold back the Spanish, the Portuguese, and yes, over to the far left, you'll see 10,000 men. Why are they there? Because that's the Vendée, and the Vendée are loyal to the old king, the Bourbon, so he's actually doing peacekeeping duties, or lo putting down local unrest, and worse, actually in his own country as well. So there's a huge commitment, so he cannot be such single-mindedly focused on Waterloo. Professor Jeremy Black said this, and I'll let you read it. That's fundamental because it sets two different agendas. Napoleon has got to destroy one enemy after another to the point where they are out of the war and no longer involved. All that Blucher and Wellington have to do is to keep him at bay and avoid a catastrophic defeat. I've mentioned some names, Blucher and Wellington. Very briefly, I'm not going to give you a potted history of Wellington, it's almost on every, every paper every television programme you can look at at the moment. Interesting though, date of birth, 1769. His opposite number, Blucher, the old Hazard, is 70 odd years of age. A hard living, hard swearing, hard drinking Prussian Hazard who hates Napoleon with a vengeance. Why does he hate Napoleon with a vengeance? Because Prussia has been beaten by Napoleon over and over again and old Blucher keeps on coming back. The two other characters in this uh, drama that's going to play out this evening, Napoleon, same date of birth uh, as Wellington, but sadly, well from his point of view, not in such good shape. He is not a well man. I am not going to bore you with uh, the books that have been written about his various maladies, uh, but he isn't 100% and he can't concentrate 100% on what is going on. And the other chap over here, born at the same time, is Marshal Ney, greatest of the brave, the Prince of Moscow, who actually was the last man out of retreat from Moscow in 1812. A man of absolutely undoubted courage, but perhaps over-promoted to Marshal. <laughs> I was talking earlier on to somebody about this. Lots of people are talking at the moment about the British Army. The British Army and Wellington's British Army. That's his British Army. It's an Allied Army. Only 29% are British infantry. Only 49% are British cavalry. King's German Legion are extremely loyal Germans who have come across into the service of Britain, fought to the peninsula. They're as good as any British infantry regiment. But you look down the rest, the Nassau's, the Brunswick's, Dutch and Belgians in particular, where's their war? They fought for Napoleon until last year. Overrun, uh, sub sub subordinated under French government, and they have produced regiments that have fought throughout the peninsula against the British. So when you're running your alliance, you have to think just how good are these people and how likely are they to stand? Well, I'll tell you now, and I hope I'll illustrate it a little bit later. By goodness, they stand. Um, no doubting some of these people, the Nassau's in particular. So that gives you a flavour for this polyglot army that Wellington's got. And of course, looking at the British contingent, they aren't all his old troopers. Why? Because of the fighting war in America, the War of 1812 to 14, and so many of the Peninsula veterans have gone away over to America. So this is not the hardened Peninsula Army. On the eve of Waterloo, and for those not oriented, I hope you can see top left is Ostend and the English Channel, Brussels in the centre. These dotted goose eggs show the dispositions in red of the British, uh, and in green the Prussians, and at the bottom blue for Napoleon. 
And what this tells you on the 14th of June is basically that Napoleon has hoodwinked Wellington, who is not expecting an attack. And therefore, all his troops are scattered in their camps and cantonments all over the country, not expecting an attack. Why? Because Napoleon's reception plan is brilliant. He stays in Paris to the very last moment. His core structure allows him to concentrate his army very rapidly. And so, within a matter of 46 hour, 48 hours, he's gone from what looks like a passive no attack posture to being massed down on the River Sombre, uh, completely unknown to Wellington or Blucher. His aim is to drive a wedge between the armies, and you see the three black arrows at the bottom. His aim is to drive up through Swatchalawa, up to Brussels, and split the two armies. Why? So he can achieve his campaign aim to knock one out of the war decisively. The four key points I'm going to talk about tonight are Catrebra, Ligny, Waterloo and Marne, which you can see there. I will be very brief on Catrebra and Ligny, partly because many of you heard me talk at length about them last year, uh, so that I can spend more time on Waterloo. I will, however, make a point that I hope you can see on the diagram. We're talking about a pretty small box in terms of distance. Between 8 to 10 miles between Catrebra and Ligny, 10 to 12 up to Waterloo, 10 across from Vav to Waterloo in miles, and 18 to Ligny. This is a small area that this campaign is being fought in, but it is not the Belgium you know now. There are no first-class roads. There are no second-class roads. These are muddy, dirty tracks. And when it rains, they're almost impassable. So it takes a long time. Between Catrebra and Ligny, eight miles, it takes an ADC to get from Napoleon at Ligny to near Catrebra, two and a half hours on a horse. I made the point about Catrebra and Ligny. Sir Michael Howard, probably the greatest living historian on this period at the moment, said this last year at a Waterloo conference. I'm afraid that for a lot of people, they will just look at Waterloo over the next few days and not realise that the conditions for Waterloo are set in these other battles. So I will very briefly tell you about Catrebra and Ligny. I pointed them out on the map. Let's look at Catrebra first, very briefly. This is where Ney is coming up with 50,000 men and by fortuitous disobedience, 4,000 men and six guns stop him. These are Dutch Belgians under the command of Saxe-Weimar who sees these cavalry approaching and they, Wellington has ordered them to move eight kilometres to the west and they decide, not a good plan, we'll stay. And they're then reinforced and they hold Ney all day on the 16th of June. One of the reasons they hold Ney, and we'll see it again uh, at Waterloo, is that the French marshals have been scarred by Wellington in the peninsula. Wellington is the master of the reverse slope. For the non-military, if you imagine a hill, you can either sit on the front and look out, or you can sit just behind and wait for the enemy to come to you. Wellington was a master of the latter. So although there are only 4,000 people behind this slope of the crossroads of Catrebar, they thought there were Wellington and a good 20, 30,000. They weren't. So the battle when it was slow to start, started at lunchtime, and by the evening, Wellington had been able to reinforce the position so that he was superior to the French, and effectively, it was a British Allied victory. Sadly, because of the screen, you can't see the wonderful picture behind, which I spoke about last year, but that is the Black Watch of Catabra. If you haven't seen it, uh, I would hugely encourage you to look at it. It really shows the Black Watch repelling the, the French lancers. Eight miles away is another battle. It's Ligny. Here, Napoleon is determined to deliver the hammer blow to the Prussians. There is a corps that we'll come across later, a corps of 25,000 men, who, for various things that I can't have time to explain tonight, do a grand old Duke of York. They spend the entire day marching between the two battles, influencing none, because they get order, counter-order, and as you know in the military, that leads to disorder. <laughs> 
The one thing they do do is eventually, when some of them turn up on the flank of Ligny, the pony is not sure who they are, so he halts his whole attack for an hour. So the attack does not go in to destroy the Prussians until 7 o'clock instead of 8 6. Probably, therefore, too late. But the Imperial Guard smashed through, they crushed the Prussians. Blucher, old hussar, on horse, tries to repel them, leading an attack of Prussian hussars and cavalry. He is on horse, he's ridden over by his own men, and he disappears from the battlefield for about two hours before he is recovered. It says in the books that his preferred medicine, apart from whatever he imbibed, uh, was to be rubbed down in vinegar. So he must have been a downward, downwind hazard for about the next two days on the battlefield. Whatever it was, it kept him going. So, these are the two battles, in a nutshell. What is the outcome of the two battles? Wellington in red is heading back towards Waterloo. Nothing worse than withdrawing, except for a British for a soldier, except for one thing. Withdrawing when you won. And it must have been hugely disheartening. He is eventually pursued by Napoleon in the direction of Waterloo. But important to our story is what's happening on the right here. The Prussians in green are heading for Baal. Why? They should be heading for Berlin, because they've been beaten. But Blucher had promised Wellington that he would support him. And support him he did. And even in his absence, Gneisenauer, his chief of staff, knew what his intent was and marched him towards Vav as opposed to the east. <coughs> Napoleon was tardy in sending somebody to chase them and eventually <coughs> sent two divisions under Grouchy, a newly promoted marshal, to try and find them, catch them, and prevent them interfering in what was going to take place at Waterloo. That is why, as Michael Howard said, you need to look at the context of Waterloo in terms of all four battles. Four battles. I've only mentioned three. Right. Var. On the morning of the 18th, this morning, 200 years ago, Grouchy had made contact with the Prussians. The ground out there is very difficult. You can see on the map, there's, there's deep gullies, there's woods. It's completely different, although it's only 10 miles to the east uh, of Waterloo. And Blucher realizes that this position is not going to be taken easily. And so at 9 o'clock on the morning of the 18th, Bulo's corps, up there, bottom left, heads off at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's heading, uh, as you can see there, for a place called Plansonoir. I'll talk about Plansonoir later. Zeton, at 12 o'clock, is heading for Mont saint jean which is just behind the Waterloo defensive position. And then Perch also leaves at 12. So Grouchy has been left hang out to dry. He isn't going to help Napoleon. He's being held by one corps, and three corps are heading towards Waterloo. And that's why Vav is the third of the four battles that is important. So now we come to Waterloo and today. I did all say to those of you who are here at the opening uh, of the museum uh, temporary exhibition earlier that this is as much about the soldiers as the generals. Private Matthew Clay served the light company of the Scots Guards, and he takes up the story on the 18th. We then proceeded until near the plains of Waterloo. A heavy thunderstorm came on, and the enemy having gained ground on us, we marched on. We reached a clover field where we halted and took off our knapsacks. The storm continued with dreadful violence, and we, thinking of remaining there for the night, were ordered to pitch our blankets. Now this will have a real resonance with the soldiers here. The company was divided into fours and cast lots to see which two of us would use and unpack our blankets. <laughs> Myself being one of the unlucky two. We fixed our muskets perpendicular to each end of the blanket passing the knob through the ramrods, and thus way making a tent under which all four of us crept. Private Clay had been marching back, retreating towards Waterloo, carrying that. That's what he made his tent from, with the ramrod and the musket. This is the brown vest. 
This is about 10 pounds in weight. You've put together his pack, his bayonet, the 17 inch bayonet, all the kit that he carries, everything that more or less he owns that the colour sergeant hasn't got with him, and you're carrying a lot of kit in the pouring rain, not showing where you're going, what's going on, because nobody tells the jock anything. So he doesn't even know why they are retreating. Anyway, he pitches his camp, pitches his tent, uh, and, and does the best that he can. The weather still continuing very stormy and had become cold. We were without food, having been deprived of our rations, which did not arrive early enough to be distributed at the time of our sudden retreat from the woods at Catrabra. We were continually kept on the alert, being frequently visited by a field officer. <laughs> During the hours of darkness. <laughs> Field officers did. <laughs> when daylight appeared, this is the dawn of the day of all blue. All being quiet on a Sunday morning, we procured some fuel from the farm at Ugamont and then lighted fires and warmed ourselves, our limbs being very much cramped and sitting on the side of wet ditches. Each sergeant uh, gave out a small piece of bread and we managed to butcher a pig which was shared between the whole company. I got a piece of the head. I find it raw and unsavoury. I put it in my haversack for later. <laughs> and taking my musket to put it in order for action, the flint musket, then as it was used, was a sad bore on that occasion, with the effect of the wet, the springs of the lock become wood-bound and would not act correctly when in action, the clumsy flint also useless. I would pick up the first musket from a dead man that I could find. And that's how it worked. That gives you a feeling for what the soldiers are going through. Pouring rain all through the night, Captain Mercer goes and shares a couple of potatoes uh, with his battery of raw horse artillery, who we'll hear a bit more about later. The effect of this rain will deploy Napoleon's deployment, the affect Napoleon's deployment and delay it. He will not be able to deploy properly until about 11 o'clock. And that, of course, this battle is time critical because the Prussians may be coming from the other direction. The preliminaries. Here is a rather fine and glamorized picture of Wellington and his staff. His second in command, not that he really had a second in command, he kept everything to himself. But that's Uxbridge's cavalry commander, and the chap in the back, uh, you probably know with the top hat, is Picton, who had lost his kit on the way to the campaign, uh, and sadly would die that day with his division. This is the British and Allied position. The red line and everything above it. It's about three and a half miles long. This is one of the last battles, perhaps, given perhaps a few of the American Civil War, where a commander can actually see the whole battle and ride from one end to the other and influence everything as it happens. Key points I want you to remember now, Hougoumont, the Chateau of Hougoumont, on the left. That's where you probably saw His Royal Highness Prince Charles yesterday unveiling a memorial. La Haissante, a farmhouse just forward of the forward slope, in the middle. Papalot, out to the left. These are the three positions that anchor the Allied position. And the last one I want to mention, Place Noir. Why did I mention Place Noir? because that's where that first Prussian corps was heading for when I showed you the Battle of Var. And that is not on the flank from Napoleon's position, it's in the rear. This is another glamorized picture. The headquarters is still there at La Caille, where Napoleon had his uh, orders group. Ney, the red fiery-headed head, Ney, uh, leaning over, Napoleon sitting there with the assembled staff, making his plans, but now knowing his artillery commander giving him unpalatable news, I can't get the guns forward until at least 11 o'clock. So the battle is delayed. <coughs> this is the French position, the dotted blue line, that you see looks quite close, and it is. It's a thousand yards, maybe a bit more, 1,500 yards between the two lines. I banged on, if you'll forgive the pun, about the artillery. <laughs> That box over there, I'd like you to get a little feel for. The box that's just left of the main Brussels Road. 
You won't be able to see the detail of this slide. I don't apologise, it's simply to demonstrate what that box is. That box is a ground battery of 80 guns, lined 1,200 metres across and probably something in the order of 300 metres deep. We see all the guns in the films, and if you're lucky, you'll see them recoil as well, which they do. Maybe you know, three, four yards. Uh, what you don't see is the fact that black powder will very quickly make the whole ridge absolutely one great cloud of black smoke and dust, men screaming and yelling as other guns are firing into them. The other thing you don't see, and why I show that box and explain all the way down on the right hand side, is what goes behind those guns. And very briefly, the first box says gun line, the second line is, is limbers, and there's about 350 horses there. The next box is the first line of ammunition, there's another 350 horses. There's a, then there's the second line of ammunition, another 354 horses. Then there's the third line caissons with more ammunition. Then behind are the field forges, the repair units and everything else. This battery is enormous. It covers a huge expanse of ground. And it will fire for a rock of the day. But its effect will be to some extent uh, degraded by the fact that Wellington is on a reverse slope position and the ground is so wet the cannonballs will not bounce, which they would normally do. Nevertheless, they will be, and it will be, effective. I like to divide Waterloo into six phases. And I will now talk you through them. They are not all following one after the other. Some go on all day, and I'll try and illustrate each of these in some detail. I'll talk you through them briefly now, and then pick up each one. We've looked at the preliminaries, the wet and tired soldiers arriving, getting into their positions and so on, the problems of Napoleon getting his grand battery into place. Phase one starts at about midday. Interesting, all these officers that have watches, but they didn't have a great time signal, and the counts vary hugely as to when the first rounds were fired. More than half an hour difference. The first attack is on the Chateau of Hougamont. That was on the left of the map as you looked at it, and we'll look at it again. The second is the attack of Derlon's Corps, and an Allied counterattack. And that starts later in the after, earlier in the afternoon. Phase three will be the cavalry attack. Phase four is the Prussians arriving at Plansmoir. Phase five is the La Haye Saint Falls. And phase six is the attack of the Imperial Guard. Those are the six phases I'm going to talk you through. The Chateau of Hougamont is the first one. There's Hougamont, and there's the blue arrow showing, showing the attack. It is supposed to be a diversion. It is commanded by Napoleon's brother, uh, and he gets sucked in more and more into this. Hougamont never falls in the whole day. Amazing feats of valour. Uh, that go on there. It's a big area. Um, it isn't just a chateau. All that, which is on the French side, the green, light green to the bottom of it, that is thick wood and orchard. And then there's orchard gardens out to the right. There's 400 men in that wood, Nassau's uh, and uh, King's German Legion, 4, 400 men who will repel 4,000 attackers for the best part of an hour and a half, and gradually fall back through that wood to the chateau. So the Nassau's are brilliant soldiers. They really commit themselves. That is the south gate of the chateau. That's pretty much what it looks like today, although it may well have been whitewashed because they've been refurbishing everything. Um, they, it is almost exactly as it was, with the orchard wall spending off to the right, the only difference is a little house to the right of the gate, a little sort of garden that's been added on. And there you see an illustration of the French who now fought their way through the woods. The storm breaks. All these French troops, all the blue, now attacking Hougamont and Hougamont being reinforced. This is pivotal. If this falls, the whole Allied flank will be opened up. That might ring a bell with some of you, 
You might have seen the statue today that was unveiled by the Lord, His Royal Highness yesterday. It's based, I think, on that picture. There's a soldier leaning against them there, and the, and the man on the other side. This is the North Gate, which stupidly, as an oversight, had been left open. And the French attack in the middle afternoon. They are led by a man called Le Grosse, the giant, the enforceur, a lieutenant in the French Light -like Infantry, a massive man with an axe. And they smash their way into Hougoumont. And then the guards, a task who is responsible for this, have to repel the attackers. Because if the attackers are through the gate and they secure the place, then that's the end of it. Lieutenant Colonel James MacDonald, the 34-year-old Peninsula veteran in charge of defence, kept his head. Appreciating the North Gate had to be closed at any cost, he yelled at three officers nearby who joined him with six guardsmen to form a ragged group that rushed the gate. Some heaved and pushed at the doors, while others savagely tackled Frenchmen, seeking to get through the sword and the bayonet. More and more guardsmen were, were firing inwardly into the courtyard from the upper windows and side buildings. It was a vulnerable moment. The French infantrymen rampaging about inside were temporarily ignored. As slowly and inexorably, the gates were pushed together. MacDonald described as a gigantic broad-shouldered Highlander from Invergarry, heaved along, alongside the equally powerfully built 24-year-old <coughs> Corporal James Graham, assisted by his brother Joseph. Graham finally dropped the crossbar into place and the attention focused on the Frenchman inside. Everyone was shot and bayoneted, except one, a drummer boy, who they spared and sent to the rear as a prisoner. That is one of the critical moments in this battle. When you open the gate afterwards, that's what you see. And again, Matthew Clay says, on entering the courtyard, I saw the doors, or rather the gates, were riddled with shot holes. It was also very wet and dirty. In its entrance lay many dead bodies of the enemy. One particular I noticed, which appeared to have been a French officer, but they were scarcely distinguishable, being all appearance as though they had been very much trodden upon and covered in mud. Clay's memoirs are absolutely first class. Um, another heroic moment in this ongoing battle. The Royal Wagon Corps managed to get ammunition in. By now, they are really running short of ammunition. As we will see, uh, this eventually is the downfall of La Haisande. But at Ougamont, they managed to get more ammunition in through the gate and keep the fight going. And as I say, Ougamont fights on, and it must have looked something like that. All the buildings in fire, um, casualties, caught in the burning buildings. It must have been quite a horrific place to be for about seven hours. This is phase one, the attacks on Hougoumont. Uh, and as I say, it isn't sequential. This is what goes on all day. And it will have, the success of holding Hougoumont will have a final effect on phase six. Phase two. Napoleon's big strike, this is Duron's attack, and then the Allied counterattack. The plan is simply this, that five divisions will attack the centre right. <coughs> That's a military diagram that shows you a div the, the core structure. Each of these divisions is about 5,000 infantry, that's why I show it. Total here, 20,000 men. That's a hell of a lot of men moving in a very small space. That is the route they take. Now, you'll see La Haison, just to orientate you, again in the centre. Wellington's position runs across the centre of the map through the 95th and byland along that road. Kemp and Pack's divisions, uh, brigades are there, which include the Black Watch, the 79th, uh, and the 92nd, all Highland regiments. So they're going to take the brunt of this attack. And this is the formidable army that 
uh, Napoleon has made his own. The 79th were deployed into line at the commencement of the action, having previously been in column. The light company, which I belong to, were ordered out and extended, so they would be forward of where it says by them, skirmishing down the slope. The, on reaching the hedge, or nearly so, where the guns, I think Rogers' brigade, were stationed, we passed through the Belgian infantry who were retiring. This is Byland, is the Belgian infantry, who were pulled back. Um, a strong column of enemy, enemy appeared on the, on the top of the opposite ridge immediately to our front. The second column was at that moment seen advancing along the valley to our left, which must come into contact with the 28th. We were cons consequently obliged to retire and joined the regiment on reaching the hedge where a tremendous conflict ensued between our line and the opposing columns, which has been said, pushed themselves so far forward as to reach the hedge line, which is on the road where it says Byron and the 95th. This is something about what it might have looked like. And I think that just gives you an impression of the sheer mass of manpower. 15 nine-pounder British, nine-pounder cannon, shrieked past from the British line and were immediately on target, bouncing through the French files, each ball scoring a succession of mud splats as they passed up to 1,200 metres away. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Hone, observing from the ridge with the third guards, so he was on a, out to the flank and could see exactly what was going on, saw the large openings were instantly formed in the columns into which most shots fell. The grisly impact was muted when viewed from a distance. A French officer later told Sergeant Edward Cotton of the 7th Hussars that 17 men were carried away in the first shot. The carnage had begun. This huge juggernaut staggers up the slope to be met almost at the top from the hedge lines by the reverse slope, well positioned British infantry, who pour volley after volley into them. The French are in column of hand not designed to produce maximum firepower in return. And as they try to reform into line, they stagger and shudder and judder to a halt. One part of one division, Marconier, actually gets up to the track, and that's about it. What do you do when your enemy is staggering and reeling? You counterattack. And now we come to the British part, still part two, phase two, the counterattack by the British heavy cavalry. This next diagram is orientated the wrong way, for which I apologize, that's just the way it is. This shows, from the British perspective, or our perspective, the, French, the British cavalry coming down over the, over the road, La Hissant now top right, and you can see the Scots Greys, Inniskillings, Royals, Lifeguards, Blues, Dragoons and Lifeguards. Huge mass of heavy cavalry who now tear in to the staggering infantry, coming out of nowhere, riding them down, chopping them about. Something in the order of 3,000 British cavalry. Ponsonby it leads the Union Brigade, and we all know the story. It's not a particularly good picture, but there is the Gordon Highlanders uh, and the Scots Greys. And the one you're probably more familiar with is that one by Lady Butler. <laughs> Major Winchester, the 92nd, wrote afterwards, about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, a column of between three and four thousand men advanced to the hedges on the roadside, which leads to the main road near Helais Farm beyond the left of our position. Previous to this, the 92nd had been lying down, under cover, in positions were immediately ordered to stand to your arms. Major General Dennis Pack calling out at the same time. 92nd, everything has given way to our right and left. You must charge the column, and upon which he ordered four deep to be formed and closed in the centre. The regiment, which was then about 20 yards up from the column, fired a volley on them. The enemy on reaching the hedge at the side of the road had ordered arms and were in the act of shouldering them to receive, and they received another volley from the 92nd. The Scots Greys came up at this moment, doubling round our flanks through the centre and calling out, Scotland forever, the Scots Greys actually walked over the column. Literally 
cut through and destroy them. In less than three minutes, it was totally destroyed. 2,000 besides killed and wounded, uh, of them having been made prisoner and capturing an eagle, as you know. But do you know that there was a second eagle captured? A lot of people then, because we all talk about Scott's Graves. This was captured uh, by the First Lord Dragoons in exactly the same charge as the Graves. And this is the man who caught it. I gave the order to my squadron. Right shoulders forward, attack the colour. Leading direct from the point myself, on reaching it, I ran my sword into the officer's right side, a little above the hip joint. He was a little to my left side, and he fell on that side, with the eagle across my horse's head. I tried to catch it with my left hand, but I could only touch the fringe of the flag, and it is probable it would have fallen to the ground had it not been prevented by the neck of Corporal Stiles horse, who came up close on my left at that instant, and again it fell. Corporal Stiles was standing covered, standing covered. Uh, his post was immediately behind me, and his duty was to follow wherever I led. When I saw the eagle, I gave the order, right shoulder, and on running the officer through, uh, I called out twice, secure the colour, secure the colour, it belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs> he then gave the colour, because he had other, other business to do, he then gave it to Corporal Stiles. <laughs> And there is a considerable debate as to who then subsequently claimed they had got the colour. <laughs> but that's the second colour that was captured. About this time, Napoleon, if he hadn't before, should have realised that the game was up. You just watched 25,000 men being turned about, ridden down and destroyed. I should say there's a quid pro quo, because the British cavalry being what they were, they exceed their remit, charge down over the French infantry, and themselves get shot up by the French cavalry. And so, effectively, the heavy brigade of one of his cavalry are written off for the day. But the cost for Napoleon is 25,000, more or less. That is the end of phase two. Phase three is the French cavalry in Bataille, probably one of the most famous incidents of the actual battle. Sometime around three o'clock, as Delon's shattered call was reorganizing itself, Marshal Ney thought he saw a rearward movement in the Allied lines. He did. It was Wellington reorganizing things, Byland's division was being, brigade was being replaced, there was some adjustment and so on. But to Ney, looking across the ridge, he thought they were making a run for it. And so he decided that he would launch cavalry attack across the ridge. And that is what comes between Hougoumont and La Haison, a huge French cavalry attack, led in person by Ney. By the time, he may not be the cleverest soldier in the French army, but he is certainly one of the bravest. By the time he leads the attack at the end of the day, he's had five horses shot from under him. <laughs> What is this huge formation of cavalry? Can you conceive? You've been to the races, you hear 30, 40 horses, the pounding of feet, yeah, the ground shakes, must be impressive. This is what's coming across the valley. Those three boxes up there represent the Light Cavalry 2100, the 13th Division and the 14th Division. The space they occupy is 700 metres and 50 metres. That's about four and a half times the length of Murrayfield Stadium. The pitch, sorry, not stadium, pitch. They are 75 metres deep. That is the <coughs> conventional width of a rugby field. Take the 14th Cavalry Division, 1,700 horses on the right-hand box in the circle, and what you've got is 1,700 Horses sitting in Murrayfield, give or take a few yards. Inconceivable. And there's more, the 13th. When they were ordered, the 13th and 14th divisions, to charge, what, why is the light cavalry with the guard there? It's because uh, Lefebvre Denouet, uh, a flamboyant French as are, thinks, I'll get a bit of this. And so without orders, he forms up and takes his 2,100 into the game as well. The diagram below shows the 14th Division, that's in Murrayfield, 
four regiments <coughs> wide, three or four squadrons deep, each squadron a hundred in two ranks. Hundred men, hundred horses, fifty, fifty wide, two deep, covering no more than fifty, sixty yards. I think now, I hope, I've painted a picture to you of this huge, huge mass of cattle that are now making their way across the plain, across the gap, and up the muddy hill. And the muddy hill, of course, is not good for the cavalry. You will see the cuirassier all wearing breastplates. A cattle brass, uh, a black box soldier, warns as he hears the pinging of the bullets off the breastplates, go for the horses, they're armoured. And that's a lesson well learned at Waterloo. That is a picture of what they must have looked like, or part of them. That's Marshal Ney and his ADC leading the charge. And so, where are they going? They're going up this slope, which has got guns lined all along it, but not much else. But behind the slope, you hear the cry, prepare to receive cavalry. And 20 British squares form up. That's a square. Everybody from the line runs in. And some of you have heard me say the most vulnerable point is closing the square where the light companies have to get in at the back. But once formed, a square is almost indestructible, provided it holds still. And they do. And there's a checkerboard formation on the reverse slope of 20 infantry squares. And these French cavalry swirl around them all over the place, unable to break or penetrate even one of them. And they're falling in tens and hundreds. They've already had the artillery fire at them on the way up. Mercer decides with his battery not to run back as is normally the custom with the gunners into the square. He and his gunners hide under the guns and the minute the cavalry pass by, they're up and manning them again. There's a British square, just one. There's 20 of those. That happens to be um, the square of the Nassau's. Again, my point is that Napoleon's allies stood firm, along with everybody else, the Nassau regiment, who'd been fighting for Napoleon in the peninsula up until 1813. Stand firm. Now, Napoleon looks at this across the valley and realizes that it has been premature. Ney has gone too early. The British are not shaken. There has been no preparatory artillery fire in that area, and it is a mistake. So what do you do? You pull them back? No. You reinforce failure. He orders Kellerman's 3rd Corps Cavalry, four brigades totaling 3,900, to join the fray. And then, just to make sure, he throws in the guard heavy cavalry. 2,000. Now, if you've been doing your sums, we're somewhere now in the region of 11 or 12,000 horsemen. But actually not, because there are probably already 2,000 dead or dying, maybe even more. For the next hour and a half, the repeated cavalry swirl around, falling back, sometimes being counterattacked by British light cavalry very successfully when they've overshot. And eventually, by the time they all fall back, some of these cavalry regiments will have charged 12 times. And it is a complete failure. Because the cavalry are not reinforced with artillery and there's no infantry at hand to take command or actually bring, bring close quarter fire to bear. So the cavalry attack has failed. Phase three. Phase four. You remember Var. And we remember Prancenoir. Prancenoir is another hell on earth like Hougoumont. Napoleon suddenly realizes the Prussians are coming on his flank and in his rear. But most importantly, into Prancenoir. And he sends part of his guard, the middle guard, the young middle and old guard, he sends a significant part to stem the tide and hold France in one. At the same time, he's spreading all sorts of uh, messages saying Grouchy's on his way, trying to make sure there's no alarm and despondency. But the reality is, anybody in France, there is no sign of Grouchy. This is a serious Prussian attack. 
Um, and he sends in General Pelle eventually. The middle guard cannot hold what is going on. Napoleon was forced to send further reinforcements on his guard. He ordered Brigadier General Baron Pelle, command of the second chasseurs of the old guard, go with your first battalion to Plasmar, where the young guard is entirely overthrown. Support it, keep your troops closed up and under control. If you clash with the enemy, let it be with the bayonet. There are now French generals, colonels, brigadiers dying in there. A glamorous picture nearer the reality as the Prussians birth through. You go there today and you can almost, although it's all been rebuilt, the church is there, the narrow streets are there, you can still really feel the nature of that little village. Plassenau was crammed with troops. 5,000 French guardsmen held the village. 20,000 Prussian infantry were either advancing through the streets or following the assault battalions in support. At the end of this whole story, at the end of the battle, Colburn, commander of the 52nd, looks back across the valley and still sees the fires burning and the fighting still going on at 8.30 at night in Plasmar. The effect this has is that it's going to delay Napoleon and eventually take away a significant proportion of his guard. So we come to phase five. Remember, La Hissant is in the centre. It's the Polar, it's Wellington centre, and that has been fighting all day, and eventually they run out of ammunition and they're driven back. That is the final French attack. You can see Wellington's main line up at the very top there. You can see the significance of La Hissant, La Hissant there, and the French columns charging through the orchard and into the flank. And as they fall back, the British line is all but penetrated. This is about as close to success as this battle is going to come for Napoleon. Ney asks for more troops to reinforce success. And Napoleon says, do you think I can make them? But he has none, and he is still trying to fight the Prussians in plants of war. A story that's just worth telling, um, the penalty for losing this is felt by one particular regiment, in particular. Where you see there's a regiment, it's the 95th, it had just fallen back, uh, just to the right above the crossroads. Actually, the regiment just behind them is the 1st, 27th Inner Skillings. They've been there all day, and they have been pummeled left, right, and centre. And now the enemy can bring cannon up, they are in square, because there's French cavalry wandering around, and they are literally mown down. When they've lost virtually all their officers, an officer from the 40th Regiment comes over to liaise with them and says, would you like some of our officers? Can we lend you some of our officers? <laughs> and the reply from Major Brown is that, oh no, the sergeants wouldn't like it. They're doing their job now. <laughs> Looking at this now, this regiment is being shot to pieces. Lieutenant John Kincaid, who's probably the real sharp from the 95th Rifles, later on in the evening, as he advances, he says he turned back to see the 27th Regiment lying literally dead in the square a few yards behind us. Only a ragged remnant got up at about 8.30 to pursue the French, leaving 480 of its 690 men lying prone, scarlet clad, in a perfect square. For those of you that heard me open the museum, I said this was a sort of battle. I think that pretty much demonstrates it. La Haysant has fallen. Everything now is ready for Napoleon to deliver the coup de grace. He's had to delay it an hour, but now is the time to unleash the soldiers that are feared throughout Europe. And phase six, sorry, that is looking back at La Haison, I should say, pretty much unchanged, looking north. And so now, phase six. The last phase, you'd be glad to know, the attack of the Imperial Guard. 
You call it the Imperial Guard, it's not all there. But before I say a little bit about them, what is in that British line? About the remains and remnants of 21 battalions, some of less than half strength. Some are really shot, and I mean shot literally, they've been at war all day. And they are all that's left to hold back the Imperial Guard. Now, uh, Wellington throws in his last reserve, a Dutch-Belgian brigade, to help stiffen the line. So he's done all he can to hold the position. And he knows what is coming, because you can see it forming across the valley. Now, there ought to be 22 battalions of Imperial Guard, but their 10 have been fighting in Plasma, uh, and others have been detached. And so eventually, there are only nine battalions of the Imperial Guard sorry, seven, bat seven battalions of the Imperial Guard, coming across that valley. They come 75 metres wide, in big columns, all the drums beating, the pas de charge, the Imperial Guard marches, and I said Hougamont was important. Hougamont is on their flank. And as they take the fire out of Hougamont, they swing halfway, half right. So instead of hitting like a juggernaut, they hit in echelon, one after the other. And that's the effect of this fire from who wants to have driven them across the valley. <laughs> but these are the Imperial Guard. The third grenadiers of the guard on the right hit the 30th and 73rd infantry, and they waver and fall back. Immediately, Wellington says, what's going on over there? And sends one of the Dutch Belgian regiments to back up behind them. The 4th Grenadiers hit the 33rd and 69th regiments. They waver. Wellington orders more of the Dutch Belgians to counterattack and stabilise the line. The 3rd Chasseurs of the Guard are now coming up over to the, more to the left of these columns. And they see no enemy as they head up to the British line. 2,000 men are hidden 20 yards away. As they breast the ridge, Wellington says, Now, Maitland, who is the commander, now, Maitland, now's your time. In a minute, stand up, guards. 2,000 guardsmen rise up out of the cornfield, literally 30 yards away from the French column. The effect of their fire is devastating. 300 fall in the first volley. The whole juggernaut shudders to a halt. But it isn't defeated. Colburn, who commands the 52nd Light Infantry, sees the chance. He's further out onto the left flank of this attack. His is one of the strongest battalions. It's about a thousand strong. And he tells his whole battalion to wheel left. And so they wheel with the guard here, the British line there, they wheel like this, and they pour another devastating volley into the French. And the French start to fall back, and they start to fall back faster, and they start to run. And they are running, and they are running, and most of them are just being swept away. And Wellington looks at the scene, these once brave guardsmen, raises his cock hat three times, and says, Oh, damn it, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> Wellington waved his hat, and the whole Allied line sweeps forward. And the whole of the French army, or most of it, literally disintegrate. As indeed is the same that is happening over in Passoir as the Prussians are breaking through. The guard reputedly will make a last stand. General Cameron is there with the guard, the old guard grenadiers. He's asked to surrender. It depends who you believe and what you believe. Some people say he said the guard never surrender. Other people say he said mer. <laughs> <laughs> Truth, sadly, is that the guard surrendered. But the story is much better. <laughs> and so. It is 8.30 at night. The Allies are sweeping across the battlefield, and Wellington 
meet through Blucher at La Belle Alliance in the centre of the French position. Blucher would very much like the battle to be called La Belle Alliance. <laughs> Wellington has other thoughts. It will be called Waterloo. A final slide. The human cost. I'll let you read it. And perhaps a last line from me bearing in mind where I am. The 42nd started this short campaign with 629. 61 killed, 185 wounded in the campaign. The majority at Catra 149 killed and injured at Catra The human cost, enormous. The cost, the price worth paying for what amounted arguably as some historians have said, to 99 years of world peace. Thank you very much. If any would, if anyone would like to, um, Charles is very happy to take some questions now if you've got the uh, In your opinion, uh, which of the battle songs uh, do you think it was when Neil cut the cavalry loose? The campaign turn when uh, Napoleon failed to fundamentally defeat Blucher on the 16th. The campaign was lost to my mind on the 16th. As far as the battle was concerned, if you had 25,000 men repulsed, that was the time at the battle to go, even before the cavalry were committed. Um, so I think the, uh, that, that would be my answer. Um, after that, you, you're throwing bad money after bad, I'm afraid. Um, Jeff, you've got a question. Yeah, um, thank you for that. That was brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed it. One, one thing that uh, always impresses me is the heavies, both at First at uh, Walter the and at Bath uh, Harbour. But um, stories I've read of late about the um, Wellington not giving much credit to a uh, brigade of light dragoons under Valdeur or something like that name. Valdeur, um, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, in general, um, Wellington did not get on well with his light cavalry, um, his cavalry at all. Yeah, he cursed them throughout the peninsula. They were forever running ahead. They were ever doing what we know cavalry do, um, from Prince Rupert and the English Civil War onwards, really. But um, so he had serious problems with his cavalry. Um, and again, there was an example with the heavies when they actually outdistanced pursuit. It is very unfair of him to be disparaging about the light, the light divisions, uh, because Vandeleur and the light dragoons did extremely well and. Having seen the problem earlier on during the day of the heavies getting out of control, Pontemby was actually not going to allow uh, the, the lights to do that. And so they fought in the afternoon with great discipline. Uh, and I think it, Wellington is quit at saying that you know, he could have been kinder to some people subsequently. And I think the light dragoons you know, certainly are coming to the, the light cavalry, certainly coming to that category.